In this edition of UNM News, we look at how local area small businesses are coping with the changing retail environment. And how Albuquerque's graffiti campaign is faring after a decade. And hip-hop and the closing of Coach's Sports Bar. I'm Sarah Supple. And I'm Lou Etamadi. All this and more in UNM News. Shoppers have been hitting the stores this holiday season, taking advantage of sales and Black Friday deals. So I covered the story and asked how many, how are small businesses coping during the season? Black Friday, the biggest day of the year for shopping. Shoppers rush to take advantage of great discounts and deals on their Christmas shopping. A new scheme, Small Business Saturday, was launched in 2010 and helps to promote smaller businesses during the holiday period. But are shoppers really aware? I don't shopping at all. I was very opposed to Black Friday um, when you were against uh, Walmart. Because big companies like that are putting small businesses, they're stopping them from earning enough money to even survive. I don't really like how Black Friday has become really immersed in the kind of post-Thanksgiving tradition. And I, and I try and sort of boycott in my own little way by shopping on Small Business Saturday and not Steve Schroeder runs a music store in Nob Hill. He says that small businesses like his may adopt a counter-marketing strategy for the holidays. What we do is, before we price something, we like to see what it's selling for online, and then we price it lower. Not only do we have a better price, but you can actually physically look at the product. You don't have to wait till it comes to you and then you pull it out and, oh, it's got a scratch on it. Hmm. You know that kind of problem? But if you're in a store and you're going, in a little store like this, in a small business, it's easier to find presents. But what can be done to help smaller businesses that do struggle during the holiday season? You'll see at the back of the store there, I have a little sign that's we're local. But I don't know that a you know, small business day has any effect on that. I mean, I could look at my sales and they're, they're probably okay. But nothing like, uh, say, Black Friday's been for us. So with more deals online and at larger stores, unique and distinctive smaller businesses are relying on other survival strategies. This is Louis Etamadi reporting. It's been more than a decade since Albuquerque Mayor Martin Chavez started the city's lauded campaign to get rid of graffiti. Still, graffiti continues to be an issue in the city of Albuquerque. And as Bianca Martinez reports, designated graffiti locations are doing little to decrease the vandalism problem. Graffiti can be seen as a form of art, but for the city of Albuquerque, it is vandalism. Bobby Cisneros is the marketing manager for the city of Albuquerque Solid Waste Management Department, and he says that graffiti is not helping the community. Studies have shown that where there's graffiti, crime rates tend to go up. Uh, children in, in those communities where graffiti is real prevalent uh, tend to not be as successful when they grow up. Uh, they tend to drop out of school earlier. Although the city has designated graffiti areas, like this one located on Montano and 2nd Street, as legal sites, Cisneros doesn't see them decreasing vandalism. I know there's a big controversy that it's a form of art, um, and I'm fine with that. Uh, however, art has its place. I mean, it always has. I mean, Joseph S. has been writing since 1988 and was inspired by seeing other work from other people. To him, writing in these designated areas is a way to create art and stay out of trouble. It's better than having that aggression channeled in other ways. If they're out tagging on your wall, they're, not, they're probably not robbing your car because they're leaving your name there. Uh, they're not out doing worse things. Lately, some local businesses, as well as private property, have been hit with unwanted graffiti. John Moda has worked for the City of Albuquerque City Division for the last six years. He and his crew clean up unwanted graffiti around the city. Some of it's art, but a lot of it is, you know, it's used for, for bad things. You know, when they start putting it on businesses and homes and... Kids are going to do it. It would be nice if they had a designated area, but then you get into gang-related type of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a real fine line on how you take the graffiti. Whether the public agrees that graffiti is art or not, 
In the end, the community is the one who pays for it. PD division is allocated $1.3 million each year. Mm -hmm. So a lot of money goes to keeping graffiti off the walls, signs, poles, everything else. This issue is yet to be settled in Albuquerque. It is not clear whether graffiti writers will be viewed as artists or vandals. This is Bianca Martinez reporting. New Mexico forests have experienced their share of wildfires this, in recent years, but Ashley Martinez reports that prescribed burns are going to be the norm, starting controlled fires to prevent uncontrolled fires, and those preventative efforts should make fires like the La Concha and Cerro Grande less likely. Forest fires have become a familiar scene in New Mexico. Now a more aggressive approach is being taken by the government to help prevent wildfires. Lawrence Lujan of the Santa Fe Forest Department says prescribed burns can help prevent major uncontrolled forest fires. This, this is going to be the new norm. We are going to be doing a lot more prescribed burning than we have in the past. The process um, consists of thinning the area so that the next stage is a prescribed burning and um, the fire that we light across the forest floor acts like a broom, um, cleaning the forest floor up. Thinning the forest plays a major role in reducing major fires, but is setting the forest ablaze really necessary? According to Santa Fe's emergency manager, Andrew Phelps, ground fuel needs to be taken care of. You do prescribe burns and reduce the amount of fuels in an area uh, when you have a lightning strike or something that's going to cause a forest fire, it's not going to have as much to burn, so it won't burn as intensely, and it'll be easier for the forest firefighters to manage uh, the impacts of those burns. With the lack of fuel, the chance of wildfire spreading to communities also decreases. It just makes managing a, a naturally occurring or even a man-made, human-caused uh, wildfire makes it a little bit more manageable and lessens the impact. Uh, preventing fires is, is really important. I guess the key is our fire managers just need to be that much more aware of what's happening in our forests um, and do things and be proactive like having prescribed burns. If Phelps and other forest managers are right, wildfires will have less of an impact on our state. This is Ashley Martinez reporting. It's been a problem for decades and it continues to plague some of the most beautiful among us, including some right here in the Duke City. Though London, Paris, New York, and Milan are the fashion capitals of the world, the modeling industry reaches the roots deep into places like Albuquerque. That's a good thing for most of those who aspire to be models, but for some, it can have tragic consequences. Kara Hitchcock reports that aspiring models are particularly prone to unhealthy understandings of beauty and the accompanying body issue problems. The life of a model is something many dream of, but modeling comes with unhealthy risks, far from glamorous. 15-year-old Tara Maestas is an Albuquerque model who says she's been victimized by the modeling industry. You worried so much about your skincare that even when you're stressed and you broke out, <laughs> you're screwed. And a lot of things hit me, like I got sick really bad. It was actually on, on and off for months showing you just different ways to make you seem skinnier and just always feeling like you had to suck something in even if you wasn't even there. <laughs> Chris Moya, a sports and wellness employee and UNM graduate with his bachelor's in nutrition, says the modeling industry can cause long-term mental health problems. But it doesn't have to be that way. Too low of a weight can basically be unhealthy, especially when the BMI is under 18.5. It can lead to bulimia or anorexia nervosa. BMI is the body mass index, a weight to height ratio. So anything under 18.5 can start leading to psychological problems. Janice Lujan, owner of the Albuquerque Phoenix Agency, says an unhealthy lifestyle is routine for models. Everybody struggles with their weight. I think it's, it's whether you're a model or not, no matter what happens to you, you go to high school or in junior high, you're made fun of for no matter what you look like, whether you're too big or you're too small or you're tall or you're short, whatever it is. And I think that that always just kind of breeds insecurities. And even as a model, I definitely um, fell into a lot of the, you know, the downfalls of just trying to try to lose weight and try to do it quickly for modeling jobs. I learned very, very quickly though that it just, it really isn't worth it. Um, eating healthy and keeping your body in shape is the best way to kind of either lose weight and, and so keep Lujan it off. So works to make sure the models in her agency have a nutrition plan. 
usually when we do have the girls that come in, what we'll do is we offer them a nutrition program, which really helps the girls, if they are going to try to lose weight, do it in a healthy way. We certainly don't make girls lose weight or um, put them into a certain category if we don't think that they're going to fit. Tara Maestas learned the hard way that the life of a model isn't necessarily glamorous. You're alone out there, you're putting yourself out there to be criticized, and without a tough shell, you're going to break. Something in you will break, and, or you will just not be able to handle any situation. This is Kerry Hitchcock reporting. Modeling is not easy, and neither is being an artist. The Albuquerque Hope for Hip Hop project works to take hip hop out of the streets and put it back into the community. A recent concert proved that reforming hip hop and positively portraying hip hop culture is a lot easier said than done. Here's Jordan Unversart with the story. Lyricist and musician James Horn founded the Albuquerque Hope for Hip Hop project, an organization that gives young adults a positive environment to explore and create hip hop music, dance, and culture. We started a couple of years back because I felt that there really wasn't like a place for kids to do hip hop. And instead of these kids going to a positive place and learning the structure of hip hop and learning hip hop business and learning hip hop dance, stuff like that, they would go to their friend's house or the big cousin's house or whoever and go record these little studios in the ghetto around the inner city. But when they would do that, they would pick up bad habits like drug use or et cetera. You know what I'm saying? Horn puts together shows several times a year for the kids to perform. He rents theater spaces instead of clubs so friends, family, and members of the community can be involved in the art. To promote the album release of Albuquerque rapper Lil Pat, the group organized a show in late November at the South Broadway Cultural Center. The songs on the 21-year-old's first independent CD, Never Looking Back, drew inspiration from people and events in his life. Lil Pat planned to debut most of the songs off his new CD for the crowd that night. They were really mostly songs from the album. I haven't really performed most of them before, so I'm interested to see if I got people respond to them. Hopefully some more people show up. <laughs> but to Lil Pat and all of the other performing artists' disappointment, more people did not show up. So right now, we're here at the theater, as you can see. There's nobody here. Nobody showed up. Seven o'clock. Everybody showed up here. So, hopefully, people will come and we'll sell it out in the next 15 minutes. Yeah? 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 yeah. Who's up around it? Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Despite a turnout that was far below the group's expectations, most of the rappers were still eager to get up on the stage. What up? It's your boy Eric Kills in the building. You already know. We out here for a little past CD release party. We about to get it cracking. It's hard to say why people didn't come out for the show. It could have been the $7 ticket prices, lack of interest, or the negative reputation hip hop receives from most mainstream MCs. A lot of people think that hip hop is about, you know, women, drugs, money, whatever, and a lot of it is about it. I'm not going to see you in your life, you know what I'm saying? But like, it's more than that, you know? It's a culture, it's an art, and the people that really do it, you know, we respect it, you know? I respect hip hop as an art form as a, and as a culture, you know? Every time that um, we put on a show, every time that we make a song, every time we do a rap, we. We do it like we're making a painting, we're professional painters, or we're professional musicians, you know. Professional musicians don't just pick up a guitar and just, ah, ah, ah I want to be a millionaire. But in the, in the rap industry, it's, it's like that. Being successful is a challenge for up-and-coming artists like Lil Pat. They struggle like all artists, but they also have to overcome the negative persona of hip-hop culture portrayed in today's media. This is Jordan Unberzot reporting. Finally, one very popular Albuquerque business said its last goodbye in November, after 15 years of sports, games, and friendship. Samantha Almack reports on the bittersweet closing of one of Albuquerque's famous meeting places. One very popular Albuquerque business said its last goodbye Sunday night, after 15 years of sports games and a place that many call their second home. 
We will always have the memories of coaches. Um, coaches is it's more than just a bar, it's a family. And when we come here, we're always with friends and with family. And the hardest part is losing the family aspect of it, and it is hard. Coach's co-owner, Ernie Blackstone, says he wasn't willing to keep renovating a 100-year-old building. I'm not going to renew the lease. Uh, I'm tired of fixing up that building for them, and uh, I'm not getting any younger. So it's, it was just one of those deals. Regular Bill O'Neill met someone very special here five years ago. My wife Amanda and I became very good friends, and after two years we knew that we were best of friends and we wed. <laughs> We always come here, we'll watch Monday Night Football, come here on Friday nights, we'll all gather together, talk about our weeks, catch up, you know, just what friends will do, what family will do. Even the employees were patrons. I've worked here for about eight months now, and I really love it. The customers, we have so many regulars that come in, it's like a family. I come here when I have nothing to do. I come here when I'm not working. We've always run it like family. That's one of the things that has made this so difficult. Um, they're all like my family, so I'm like a dad to them. So. <laughs> Well-known regular Toby Riffick had been coming to coaches for eight years to watch the Super Bowl games and do some performing of his own. I've been hosting this karaoke probably about a year, almost two years now. And um, so, and it's real fun because I get to meet a lot of new people, meet a lot of people that, are, that become friends, and I get to see them uh, sing their songs, and it's, it's cool because, uh, I mean, there's a lot of talented people that do sing karaoke, and, and it's awesome. So. Patrons say there's just no other bar like this one. You know, it's, it's a nice place to come to down by UNM. There's not really too many places that are just like this casual with the type of atmosphere that they have around here, so... There's really no other sports bar like this. It's a second home to everyone, and I'm, and I'm sure other people feel that way about their own bars, but here I, I've been other places and nothing beats this, honestly. The big question is, where to go now? Wherever Ernie goes, we will follow. I'm going to say about three words. Uh, number one is my wife, because she's uh, been with me through this whole thing. We tried to be a neighborhood bar where everybody knew your name. Yeah. And that's what we did. And uh, after 15 years, I'm looking at all of you saying, oh my gosh, am I out of my mind? <laughs> it is what it is. I thank you all for being here. I love you all. And coaches, uh, for being your memories forever. Thank you very much. This is Samantha Almec reporting. I'm Lurie Tamadi. And I'm Sarah Supple. Thank you for joining us tonight.